This episode of Hazy Outdoors is brought to you by Tooth of the Arrow, American-made broadheads. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Hazy Outdoors. We've got a very special episode today. I'm joined with Lee Houck of Tooth of the Arrow Broadheads. We're going to be processing my spring bear and turning it into sausage. Thanks for joining me, Lee, today. Yeah, dude, thanks for having me. It was cool. I was a part of pulling this bear out of the bush, so we're going to see it from field to table here today. Yeah, very excited. Did a couple things here um, last night. We took the casing, put it in water, and left it overnight. And then over the last couple days, have had the bear in the fridge thawing a little bit just so it's easier to trim and cut up. I haven't really done this other than with a moose with my dad. So Lee's going to be running the table quite a bit here. Where are we going to start? Well, yeah, like Zach said, the first thing is even the night before you want to get your casing soaking. It makes them stretchier. If you don't do that, then you're going to get a lot of blowouts, which is when you're stuffing sausage, the casing will overfill and it'll explode and it really slows you down and messes up the process. Um, the other thing would be something we just did is get your grinder parts, mainly the tube and the blade and the, uh, the plate that it's going to be ground through, get that stuff in the freezer while you're doing all this because you want to keep everything here absolutely as cold as possible. So we'll just get to cutting this up into uh, a size that we can put through the grinder and cleaning it up and we'll go from there. Yeah, perfect. Let's get going. So the nice thing about having a really good grinder, like what we have here, we have the LEM uh, Big Bite number eight, it's the same one I have at home, is you can put a lot of silver skin through a grinder like that. Not obviously the really big chunks of it, you want to get that off, but stuff you might normally cut off, you can leave on. And it's actually really healthy for you. Typically the reason you would leave it off is just because your grinder can't handle it. So when I'm cutting into this, especially on a bear that was killed when it's warm outside, if I see any sort of brown on it, that's not a bad thing, it's just what happens when oxygen hits the meat. Just smell it, and if it smells rancid, you'll know instantly, and then just get rid of that or cut it away. But it just has a bit of a bear smell to it, <laughs> and it's fine. And if you've watched my channel at all, Tooth of the Arrow Broadheads on, on YouTube, I've made a few videos about things you can do with, uh, with your animal for your dogs, like cutting up bones and dehydrating liver and stuff. With bear, I don't recommend doing any of that just because of the possibility of trichinosis with the bones and meat. Um, but the big thing is, and this, this came from a vet, not me, is that bear liver is way too high in vitamin A. It'll actually give your dog vitamin A poisoning. So just throw that bear liver out. And honestly, with the back strap piece like this, yeah. there's going to be there's going to be one side, this top side, that it's really easy to peel down yeah. and cut it until you get, you know, here, and then all this back strap or this silver skin can be ground. Okay. Yeah, I'm definitely a little less careful with bear than I am with deer. Well, you're not making steaks and stuff out no. of it. And most people are. Most people wouldn't even take this bear home. So. No. I've already cut myself. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it does smell So fine. what would you do with this fat then? Like this huge piece of fat, would you throw that in there and grind it up, like clean this? And that's totally good fat to use in sausage or just eat, um, but all bear fat is renderable. So we kind of keep it in a separate pile and once we get to the point of, uh, of grinding here and mixing, we will measure it out, measure out the proportion and we'll use pure bear fat in this rather than adding pork like you would normally have to. Yeah, we should get through this pretty quick. Oh yeah. It's still ice cold too, eh? Yeah. And how long have you had this out? This has been outside since, like in the basement, since nine o'clock last night. Yeah, and it's still, you know, quite frozen in some parts. So, you know, there's, a, there's always worry about leaving meat at room temperature, but you know, as long as you're, you're clean and there's no bugs flying around your house, you're gonna be okay. So you're gonna, what you're doing now is you're trimming off this outer layer of fat first. Yeah, exactly. Just cause this is kind of dirty, but you can see as soon as I get in here, it's super clean and this is all good fat. So you're just trying to take that top dirty layer off exactly. and then, okay. Whereas with, you know, deer, elk, you'd be taking this fat right off. But with deer and elk, this fat chunk, you could almost tear it off because mm -hmm. it's more chalky. There you have to cut it. And for those watching who are mortified that I'm just cutting right in the hindquarter, that's because it's going into sausage. I would never do this to a deer. 
when we're doing the mix of fat and meat for uh, for any sausage you have to ask yourself whether you're doing pure fat which is what we're doing here obviously because this is just bare fat or if you're doing uh, pork meat uh, it's it's a little bit different if you can get pure pork fat um, that's great but uh, you have to adjust accordingly so Everyone's got a preference on it. I don't like too much fat. I want it to still be a game sausage. So if we're doing it like this with pure fat, I do about 12 to 15% fat and the rest is just meat. If I'm doing it with pork, uh, which is obviously has pork meat and fat in it, I do closer to 20, 25%. So we're gonna do here just about three pounds or just shy, which is actually right there of uh, this clean bear fat and then 20 pounds of bear meat. So we just finished cleaning off the quarters and measuring it all out. We had these sitting in the freezer still. They're nice and cold now. Um, so we're gonna run it all through the grinder and then get into the mixture with our seasoning, which is gonna be maple sausage. When you have a really good quality grinder like this one, you can run this whole thing through. This is about 25 pounds, 23 pounds of meat. You can do the whole thing on one pass. If you have a little bit of a lower end grinder, there's nothing wrong with that. Just give your grinder some breaks so you don't burn out the motor. And we're also gonna do two passes. So we're gonna use the coarse plate and then we're gonna run it through again a second time on a finer plate. It might seem like extra work right now, but it really does make a better texture for your sausage at the end. So we got all that meat through the coarse plate and now we're currently uh, putting it through the fine plate. We're gonna put all that through it just so then, like we said earlier, it's easier to stuff into the sausage casing. So we got a lot of meat here to go. But as you can tell, the difference between the two. So now that we got it through the fine grinder, we're uh, gonna measure out our water. You just wanna follow your recipe here, um, the packages that we have have all the directions and instructions for us. So we're just gonna be going by that. It just adds to the texture of the meat um, in your sausages. We got our maple sausage seasoning here. Gonna put it into the mixer and mix it up with our water. At the same time on Instagram, if you guys saw it, uh, this is the time that we're gonna be answering some of the questions that people have been asking on Instagram. So the first one by eBay, this one's more for Lee is, Tips for someone looking to buy their first bow. So what kind of tips would you give someone, Lee? Well, the first thing is that you're, you're better off buying a new old model bow than you are buying a used bow. When you buy a used bow, you might be buying somebody's problem. And of course you might not know that, but you can find you know two or three year old brand new models of a bow and you know, it's, it was a flagship bow in its time. There's nothing wrong with that. So um, that would be the first tip. Try to buy new, even if it's an old model. The second thing would be don't go on the super cheap end of things because once you get good at archery, which won't probably take very long, you're going to wish that you had better gear. So find middle of the road gear. I would budget, you know, in Canadian terms, if Americans are watching this, you can do the conversion. I'd budget about a thousand bucks for your bow, your sight, your stabilizer, your arrow rest, and then arrows on top of that. So yeah, it's a bit of an investment, but um, I've seen it you know, so many times guys go on the ultra cheap side and they don't enjoy archery because their equipment isn't doing them justice. So those would be the biggest tips. Don't go totally cheap, but uh, you don't need a $2,500 bow either. So next one's from Sophie. Lee knows her pretty well. Fairly well. <laughs> Um, she said, what was the coolest thing that you learned on that bear hunt? I don't know if I really learned anything um, that like cool out of it. Like I've, I've been bear hunting before over baits and things like that. But just the experience of being 20 yards from a bear and then just being able to be that close to such a big animal and an animal that if they really wanted to could attack you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like... Because they are they are bears, they are predators still. 
So that would probably be the coolest thing is just being able to be just that close and being able to watch so many bears and just see how every single bear has a different personality. But you know, I, Zach, I know you learned a lot about tracking bears. Oh, yeah. Like, tell us what, what happened with that bear. Yeah. It surprised us. Yeah, so we, uh, we shoot, the, shoot the bear and Lee was out at a different bait waiting on bears. So I text the guys and Brian was actually the first guy there and he has guided for bears before. So he knows what he's doing, he's got a shotgun. So we went in after it, saw the arrow, for me, I was like, okay, that's that's pretty decent blood on it. So we track it in. It's tough to find where it starts. It's super wet up there in the spring. It was raining all the time. But we ended up finding like a pretty decent blood trail. Like yeah. it ran forever through the thickest weird. stuff. Like we looked at the video and it, it was this one was was new for me because the video it was exactly where I would have placed the arrow. It was perfect as far as I could tell, but then the blood on the arrow didn't look amazing to me. So I was a little thrown off by it. We all were. But it's crazy how, when they get that much adrenaline, they can just go forever. And same thing with deer, elk, moose, everything like that. When they get their adrenaline going, they just don't stop. They got a will to live, that's yeah. for sure. And when we found your bear, the next day. Actually, this is the coolest thing that I learned yeah. about the bear. <clears throat> we found your bear the next day and you could tell it had backed itself into a corner, which makes sense. Yeah. Like, that's what I would do if I had been shot and something was chasing me. Yeah. And so clearly it didn't run and crash, mm -hmm. uh, but it had backed itself into a corner and ended up dying there. So we know it didn't die immediately, yeah. very quickly, I'm sure. But that was, it was just super interesting to kind of you know, play that forensic role. The next one we got from uh, Carnivore Roar is what's the pros versus cons of baiting? Knowing I, knowing I am 100% pro baiting. So he's actually on Wild Talk. We did a podcast together, Steve and I. He's from BC, so they're not allowed to yeah. bait there. Pros for baiting would be that you have the bears coming in and you're able to pick and choose like that's the number one thing is yeah. that you can be selective yep right like it happens with whitetail all the time because you can't bait whitetail here in alberta and saskatchewan you can and you see way bigger deer come out of saskatchewan and there may be a genetic component to that but a big thing is that hunters in alberta are like holy crap i finally found a deer and they just shoot the first thing they see whereas baiting allows you to be selective and ultimately that's better for first and foremost the animal but also us yep well, and especially with bears where you're not allowed to shoot, like legally, you're not allowed to shoot a bear with cubs. Nope. If you see a bear on the edge of a field and you can't see the cubs, but you're watching it and their cubs are 10 yards into the bush because she's walking down on the outside to watch for predators and everything like that. But you don't see those cubs. You never know if you never know if they're yeah. there or not. And you then by the not. time you go shoot them, you're like, oh, this was a sow. But you never know if they have cubs yeah. where if you allow them time to come onto the bait and if you think, and I can't do it because I haven't seen enough bears in my life, but if you can distinctively define between a sow and a boar, you can see them like, okay, this is a sow. Maybe it's one that you want to shoot, which is totally fine. You can yeah. shoot sows as long as they don't have cubs, but at least that gives them the opportunity for cubs to come in later if the sow is checking it out first before sending her sure. cubs in. For sure. That's a big one. And, you know, like the, there's a lot of sentiment out there about it. You know, it's cheating. It's unfair to bait them with, uh, with food, but you know, humans have been hunting like this forever. It's the way humans hunt, you know, cougars have a certain way that they hunt humans have a certain way that we hunt. And this is a part of how humans have always hunted and to, to be baiting bears is not a, it, it doesn't make the hunt a slam dunk. You know? no, it's not a home run. Not at all. Yeah, and I don't know if there's really any cons to it. Like, there's a lot of work that puts into it, a lot of money that yep. goes into it with getting things set up. As we like, as we saw this here, like the getting that set up and that many baits set up for enough guys and keeping them topped up, it takes a lot of time and effort and money as yep. well. Unless you have connections that give you free food or cheaper food, like it costs a lot to bait, and it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to bait. So that's probably one of the only cons to to baiting over a spot and stock hunt. Yeah, and I guess the only other one is the potential of bringing grizzly bears into a yep. bait unintentionally. But you know what, if you're hunting in an area for black bears that grizzlies exist, whether or not you're baiting, you have a risk of running into a grizzly. Mm -hmm. 
So to me, that one doesn't really count. Yeah. But. We got two more. Um, Mr. Mo class. He said, how excited are you for next spring? Well, after doing this, I'm very excited. It's just more meat in the freezer. So there's a big stigma to bear meat because it's a predator. Yeah, it's a predator. They're eating a lot of different things and especially over bait. Like this one was shot over bait. And so people are like, well, I don't want to go eat a bear that's been eating out of the things that I'm throwing in it, whether it's meat that's sitting out for days or like the grease and everything like that. People, it turns them off to it. Yeah. Where, which is fair, but I think you got to give it a try. You know, and a big part of it is that, you know, even though we're feeding them things we wouldn't think we would eat, bear bait is commonly things like popcorn mm -hmm. and, you know, syrup, which they're eating a ton of, yeah. but it's just syrup or grease. You know, the grease that guys use in bear baiting is it's the same grease your Chinese food last Friday was cooked in, yep. right? So you are eating it and I get it. It's a little different. It can be a little off-putting, but it's not like these bears were born and raised on that. You know, no. they're eating it for a period of a few weeks. It's not their only source of food. It's not something I would worry too much about. So, but yes, I am excited for next spring. And then Brian, the, the bear, Whisper, bear master, yeah, yeah, the bear master, the guy that set up bear camp this year. Thanks again, Brian. For, He's the reason this is all yeah. happening. So he said, for next year's spring bear hunt, would you rather tree stands or box blinds? Tree stands, man. Lee likes tree stands. I've never hunted out of a tree stand before. Like the biggest thing for me b between a tree stand and a blind is that in a blind, you can move around very freely because you're covered, you know, from here down. Um, but you can only see the window and you're mm -hmm. constantly doing this. When you're in a tree stand, you have to sit quite still, but you can see everywhere. And that really adds to the hunt for me. Um, you know, it it's just more fun. I like to be more immersed in it in that yeah. sense. Animals typically don't look up by instinct, whereas they will look at that blind and think that thing's weird. Yeah. So I do believe that there's advantage to a tree stand and yeah. I'll make sure we, we get you in one this fall or, Perfect. or this spring, it'll be fun. Yeah. Well, and Brian shot his out of a tree stand, so it has worked and I shot mine out of a ground blind. So at the end of the day, whether a tree stands in your budget or even just building your own blind with, with broken down trees and things like that, you're gonna find success either way. There's no, true method that works 100% of the time. Time in the woods is the method. Yep. That's the only method that works. Spend enough time in the woods and you will find success at some yeah. point. Well, thank you guys for sending in your questions. We really appreciate it. I hope you guys learned a little bit. Lee's been getting his arm workout in here, um, but we're I think here. we're, yeah, we're pretty good here. So now we're gonna get it all stuffed into the casing. So we're getting ready to stuff here. Um, we got, we're using natural hog casing. Hog casings are perfect for that classic smoky size that you're looking for. Um, and you always wanna go with natural casings in my opinion. They're a little bit more difficult to work with, but the end result is just perfect. They're amazing. So we're gonna load this stuffer up. It's very important that your casings have been soaked overnight, like I mentioned at the beginning of the video. And then we'll just uh, break down the process. It's a bit finicky, it's a bit of a learning curve, but once you get it, this is actually a super quick process and you'll end up with some, we'll have you know quite a few big sausage rings here in just a few minutes. So when you're packing your meat into the stuffer here, every you know few scoops you wanna pack it right down to get any air of it, out of it. Otherwise, when you're stuffing, all that air is gonna push out into the casing and it can risk blowouts and it just slows you down. There's a less consistent product from it. So as Zach's pushing this in here, every few scoops, he's just gonna really press it down and compact it as well as he can. So while Zach's uh, stuffing the the stuffer, you're stuffing the stuffer. Stuffing the stuffer. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and load the, the casing. Sometimes you'll get casings like this. This makes it really easy. If you end up getting casings that are just in a ball, you just gotta take your sweet time unraveling them. But it's all the same in the end. So I always get the stuffing tube really wet with water. There's gonna be jokes about me making that movement. It always is. <laughs> So now we're loaded up, we're ready to go. The first thing is you just wanna get the surface that you're working on really wet with water because this whole sausage ring is gonna to need to be able to slide around really easily. Take the end and just tie a, just a normal knot on there. Square knot, I guess you call it. And then before you do anything, you can have a 
prop or sausage poker or just use push pins like this and you got to poke some holes in the end of the casing this is going to allow like even though Zach was really good about pushing air out of here there's still going to be air in there so then we'll poke some holes just all along the whole casing and as we go we're going to have to do a lot of this so now that you're going to see the very first thing that happens is air is just going to expel out of here there it is. You'll get really fast at it when both of us are going here, but you don't want it overstuffed. It's better under than over because you can twist and tighten it up down the road. And we're just going to keep doing this through the length of the whole sausage. So yeah, as Zach's going here, he'll get going pretty quick. He's holding tension here to keep the casing at, a, at the right tightness, a little bit tighter there. And I'm just going to guide it into a ring. And anytime I have a free second. I'm just gonna poke holes randomly throughout it. This is gonna help air escape so it doesn't burst open when you're cooking it. And if you see any air holes or air bubbles in the casing, like even right here where he's starting, I could go in there. And... So it's that quick. We got to the end and I wasn't really paying attention. So I'm just gonna twist and squeeze out that last bit so that I can tie this end off and we'll just repeat the process until we're this counters full of sausage rings and yeah just on the end exact same thing you did at the beginning just a square knot is all you need while Zach's loading up the stuffer here I'm just gonna poke you know a thousand holes in this thing you really can't poke too many holes and it helps a lot when you're cooking it to not get them to burst open so now I just flipped it over, I poked that whole first side, but when you flip it over, you'll see there's a ton of air bubbles on this other side too, and you just gotta keep working those out. So we're not quite done, but we're, we're gonna link this up just to show you guys how it all works. I've poked the whole thing, there's very little air in here. So starting just with this end, I'm gonna cut that off, and. You can cut off this at the end, but leave it for now. Press down with your fingers about the size of sausage you want in two spots. And you're going to come in from the end and create that, that size that you want. Squeeze it really good. And then you're just going to twist until the tension feels about right to you. The more you do it, the tighter the sausage is going to be. And that tends to a better texture. Just don't go too far that you're, not, that you're uh, going to blow it out that can happen too. Just like that. We're just gonna keep going the whole way down. And then once that process is done, I like to let these sit in, like normally I do this in, in the winter. I can put them outside for a couple hours and I don't worry about the, uh, the temperature at all. Oh, you see that one actually did blow out right there. That's fine, we'll just throw that back in the stuffer and that'll just be one slightly funny sausage. But typically then you'll leave these sit in the cold for you know, a couple hours before cutting them, but because it's summer here and we don't want to do that, we're just going to cut them after this and it'll be fine. And from there you can just package. So that's it. We got all of our sausage stuffed into the casing. Thanks again, Lee, for coming out and being a part of the whole process, you know, of course. being a part of tracking the bear, bringing it out and now bringing it from field to table. So thanks again. Where can everyone uh, reach you, Lee? on your socials and everything that you do. Yeah, well, first of all, of course, man, that's what it's all about. I'm happy to do it. This is this is why we hunt at the end of the day. Um, you can find me, of course, Tooth of the Arrow is uh, the company I'm super closely affiliate, affiliated with, uh, but you can check out my podcast, uh, The Let Off on uh, Amazon, Apple, Spotify. It's uh, If you're into the really technical DIY archery stuff or you wanna learn more about that, that's what I do on there, so check it out. Yeah, so thanks again, and we'll see you guys all in the next episode.